Welcome to worship. We are so excited to be able to come together with you this weekend because this weekend we begin a new series in all of our services at both of our campuses entitled The Big Ten. What is The Big Ten? We're actually going to be diving into the Ten Commandments. It's, they're not just a list of do's and don'ts for the Christian life, but it's actually a covenant relationship with God. Today we look at the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before you. God being God of our lives. Now, how many of us walk into church every Sunday morning? We watch faithfully online every week, and we say, God, you are God of my life. But is he really? Are there other things that take precedence over him? Are there things that wedge their way in between us and God? Today, we're going to learn a little bit more about that and dive deeper into how we can make God the top priority. We are excited now to go into his presence, and we are so glad that you are with us. Let's go and worship him. Let's open up our hearts and our minds and hear what he has to speak into them today. Good morning. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's good to see each and every one of you today. My name is Dennis. For those worshiping with us as visitors, we're glad you're here as well, those worshiping online. And I pray that you had a wonderful holiday last week. It's so good for me to be back with you. Thank you for your prayers as I was gone last week. Some of you may not even know that I was gone, but I do appreciate you and, and Tom Danklison for an excellent sermon last week. Thank you for your leadership last week, as well as Pastor Clarence, who led us in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Where we're officially kicking off the fall season starting today, although fall is a couple weeks away, with a new teaching series in both of our campuses here at Grove City and over at St. Mark's throughout our six services that we're offering today. One theme, the Ten Commandments, and I'm super excited to be sharing this series. Actually, I've thought about this series for some time now and waited until this time to begin where we're looking at these blueprints for living and we are going to look at them through the lens of the Lord Jesus Christ to see how Jesus took them to even a higher dimension that affects us as individuals and as a church as well as a community and nation and I pray that these will be a blessing to you as every week we're going to be looking at these all the way to Thanksgiving. And um, I appreciate your prayers. So that begins today. We are, still are not passing the offering plates every Sunday, but we are still taking an offering. And so I want to thank you for your worship of the Lord, for your giving. You can do that today by giving an offering in one of the offering boxes by the doors of the sanctuary, or you could just mail in your offering or give online today. But it's a way that we acknowledge that God is first in our life and our finances and we carry on his mission here in this church and throughout the world. Also, I've been asked to announce that we will start our Christmas mission next week, even though it's September the 19th, we are going to start collecting um, items for children around the world through Samaritan's Purse, Operation Christmas Child. We've done this for years, and we will have uh, 500 boxes to fill, at least 500, and they will be here next week to pick up at the mission table where we have our instructions to take them back and there'll be more information next week. So I'm just giving you a heads up this week and then we will do our work and then bring them back in on November the 14th. So next Sunday we'll begin our Operation Christmas Child Mission Focus. Well, today God has given us the gift of life to get out of bed, to come together, to sing hymns, to offer prayers as a community, and to learn from the Holy Scriptures. I pray that it'll be a blessing to you, but our corporate worship, I know, will bless God. And so now let us draw our hearts uh, to God as we enter this hour of worship.
morning. Our call to worship, the words are on the screen, in response. The Lord be with you. And also with you. God of heaven and earth, we long to follow after you. In this hour of worship, help us to listen, learn, and act guided by your Holy Spirit, so that we may live as disciples who listen, speak, and act with truth and love. Praise be to God. Amen. If you'll stand, if you're able, and join in our opening hymn, Come Christians, Join to Sing, that's on page 158 or on the screen above. Be seated. As we go to the Lord in prayer, we are aware this weekend marks the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attack and all over our community and nation we've been pausing to acknowledge that and to remember and to pray. And we want to do that today on this weekend. And so today's prayer focus will be on our nation and on those who lost loved ones, and healing of our nation and world. Before I lead us in prayer today, I want to also say that this week um, we lost two beloved, longtime church members. We went on to the church triumphant. The first person that passed away was Byron Miller on September the 9th. We appreciate Vi and her love for the church and ministry and her calling hours visitation will be at Spence Miller Funeral Hall tomorrow from 5 to 7 p.m. And then the funeral will be at Spence Miller Funeral Hall across the street. I'll be leading that at 10 a.m. We will be coming after the graveside services over to the church and sharing a small luncheon for the family. And let me just say, I wanna thank all those who participate in those lunches, those helping hands, we have a wonderful ministry, and some have been doing it for a long time, and they're so faithful. So thank you if you're part of that, or if you want to be, uh, let us know, let the church know. We'll be happy to point you in the direction of those who offer that ministry. But that'll be that'll be on Tuesday. And then also, Vita Voiles, longtime faithful member, went to be with Jesus this week. Her memorial service will be in Illinois, and so we... We'll not be holding it here, 
but we remember and celebrate her life today, and we pray for her family in this time. There are others on your hearts and, and minds today, and so we're going to pause for a moment of silent prayer, and then I'll lead us as we remember uh, this memorial weekend of 20 years, and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray together. God of grace and God of glory, on this anniversary weekend of the terrorist attacks of 9-11, grant us, the church, wisdom to remember the lessons from that tragic day. Make us today more Christ-like. As we look back and recall where we were, who was with us and how we felt that fateful day, may those vivid memories compel us now to acts of kindness, words of love, and demonstrations of community. May the many images of helpers and firefighters and police officers and pastors and office workers and ordinary citizens be icons that inspire us today to be helpers too. We pray for those whose lives were forever changed on September 11, 2001. Grant comfort to those who still grieve. Strengthen those who struggle even today with questions that seem to be unanswered. And today, Lord, we do want to come in this place to thank you for the people who every day in Grove City and around the nation put their lives in danger in order to protect and serve others here at home and across Ohio and America. We pray for our first responders, for medical personnel, for police officers and firefighters and others who never know what a shift at work will bring on any given day. Grant them wisdom and courage and safety and rest. Lord, we're grateful for the new life born since those attacks, even those in our church, those children and now teenagers and they're in the college who don't remember that day. But we also give thanks for the saints who were with us back then, 20 years ago, but since have gone on to eternal life. And finally, Lord, as we pray for our nation, as we mark this anniversary, we also remember those loved ones at home who need prayer, those in the hospital and nursing homes, those who've lost loved ones that we mentioned or go unmentioned today. Heal those of body, mind, and spirit. All this we pray in Jesus' name, who is the light of the world, the Prince of Peace, the Good Shepherd, our friend and our helper, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, how would be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Diane and Marla, it's so touching. This morning's scripture lesson comes from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of slavery, your slavery. You must not have any other God before me. You must not make for yourself an, an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children, the entire family, the sins of the, the entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Honor your father and mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land of the Lord, of the Lord your God is giving you. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. You must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox, donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, as I begin, mentioned at the beginning of the service, it is great to be back in the pulpit, I did miss you and I prayed for you last week and it was good to, to get away, but it's always good to come home. I came home on Tuesday. I was in Wyoming and had a wonderful time and came home. And when I got home, I was driving on 270 and 270 is crazy enough, but this day seemed extra crazy as I got a phone call from my wife and I answered my cell phone and she said, Dennis, I just want to give you a heads up. I'm watching the live news and they're saying that there's some guy driving the wrong way on 270. Did you hear about this on Tuesday? Some guy said, just really be careful. And I said, Rachel, it's worse than that. There are hundreds of people driving the wrong way. <laughs> That didn't really happen, but I got you this morning and you're smiling. We're starting a new teaching series on the Ten Commandments, and hopefully these sermons will prevent us from driving the wrong way in life. Which way is the right way? We are people who are going a certain way and we think it's the right way and there are other people going the opposite way and they say it's the right way. Which way is the right way? Because we live in a time in which our society, maybe more than ever, needs direction. If ever the society needed a moral compass, I believe it is now. And this teaching series, I hope, will help us to see God's direction for us as individuals and us as a congregation and us as a community. In fact, uh, a lot of our 
law today in the United States has been based foundationally on these commandments. And even though that we'll be referring to some of that, we will primarily be focusing on our own lives and our church as we look at how these ancient commandments speak to us today. Are they relevant for our lives? And we shall see that they are. Uh, several years ago, about 20 years ago now, I was visiting the Crystal Cathedral in, in Garden Grove, California. Dr. Robert Shore was the pastor. Of course, he's deceased now, and the cathedral's been sold and become a Catholic church today. But 20 years ago, it was a great place to walk around, and it was very beautiful. Landscaping was perfect, and if you've ever been to the Crystal Cathedral, then you're aware that they had various statues that are throughout the grounds that depict Bible stories, and one caught my eye. It was a huge statue of Moses holding the Ten Commandments, walking down from Mount Sinai. And what intrigued me were the words inscribed at the bottom of the statue, and they said this, God's way to the good life. I love that, God's way to the good life. And thinking about that little statement that stayed with me all these years, I thought, wow, that sums up what I want to say in the next 10 weeks. The Ten Commandments are guidelines for living, they're blueprints for living, and they're blessings, not curses for us. And I pray that that's how we'll see them as we unpack them week by week. This teaching series and all of our services with all of our pastors will take us all the way to Thanksgiving as we see how more than ever this society this church, our own lives, need the Ten Commandments as our foundation today. God's way to the good life. And so if you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to turn to Exodus chapter 20. They read verses 1 through 17. I wanted to read them all today. Now in the weeks to come, we'll probably just focus on the commandment that we're going to deal with. If you don't have your Bibles, you can just listen along as I read the first three verses. If you're at home watching online, you may have a Bible app on your phone or on the computer. You can pull it up to, to Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 3. Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words. Now, put this in the perspective here as he's speaking. We have this image of Moses gathering the Hebrews at the foot of Mount Sinai. The Bible depicts thunder and lightning in the booming voice of God. And it says this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, to understand the Ten Commandments as a whole, we have to understand that these commandments do not begin with the negative. They do not begin with the thou shalt not. They do not begin with you shouldn't do this. Then we give you ten things you shouldn't do. Instead, they begin with the character of God. They begin with who God is and who we are. And he, they begin with the relationship. I am the Lord, your God. Underline the word, your. The one who brought you out of slavery, the one that brought you out of Egypt, the one that redeemed you, the one that set you apart. Therefore, in that context, because I'm your God and you're my people, you shall have no other gods before me. This is the best way for you to live. This is the way to blessing, not cursing. Now, why is this? Back in Genesis, God called a person named Abraham out of paganism, out of polytheism. Poly means many, the worship of many gods, and brought him to a land that was not his own home, that made it his new home, a land which we call today the land of Israel. And Abraham and Sarah moved. 
with the promise that God had given them that God was going to bless him and his family and his descendants and that through his family would become a blessing to the world and what we now know is Jesus Christ our Lord and God blessed Abraham and made covenant with him and then blessed Isaac and Jacob and down the line by the time we get to the second book of the Bible Exodus we see however that the people of God Abraham's descendants had been living in slavery for 430 years and they cried out for their God to help them to save them and so God sent Moses to deliver them out of the hand of Pharaoh and they crossed the Red Sea and they made their way into the Sinai and so that is the context of what's happening here God had delivered them he had claimed on their life he had every right to say I'm the one who saved you from Egypt I'm the one who delivered you therefore what I'm asking of you is that you shall have no other gods before me now as Christians we ask the question do the Ten Commandments apply to us I mean, that's the Old Testament right we're not under law but under grace so do they apply to us the answer is yes Jesus said I did not come to abolish the law but to do what to fulfill it and so through the lens of Jesus we see these Ten Commandments and its foundation still speak to us and there are cultural things that may not speak to us which we're going to unpack every week like most of us don't have servants at our house we don't live on a farm we don't have livestock or whatever to rest and all so we're going to look at how that would apply to us today in Grove City in this modern age but the concept but the principle through the lens of the Lord Jesus Christ who took these to a higher dimension still stands and they're the road to blessing sometimes we have a tendency to think well God's just a bunch of do, do's and don'ts and he's just a celestial killjoy no these Ten Commandments were given to help the people he said I have claim on you I'm the one who redeemed you I took care of you and now let me tell you how best the society should live and so God is not a celestial killjoy but he's also not simply a genie in a bottle or a celestial Santa Claus <laughs> He says, I have claim on you. If you're a Christian, which that's who's gathered here today, you've been bought with a price, the Bible says. You're not your own. You've given your life to Jesus Christ. You're in covenant with God in Christ. God has saved you from your Egypt, from the land of bondage. And so he has every right to say, if you live in this covenant, then these are the things I desire of you. You know, we are saved by grace. It's free, but it's not cheap. <laughs> Jesus said, even if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And so we find these commandments that Jesus would have known well. He would have taught, being in the Jewish tradition, and he would have lived. So again, the Ten Commandments do not begin with the thou shalt not. They begin with the character of God. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of bondage. Therefore, you shall have no other gods before me. So to sum up the first commandment, which is today, is simply this. Let God be God. God desires no other gods before him. He's number one. We've said this before, I say it again. The main thing is to keep the main thing, what? The main thing. To keep God as number one in our lives. Now, all of us would say we give our allegiance to God. Let's be honest, if you were here today, then you have a leaning, a tendency to believe in God. I would say if we had a survey today, 100% or maybe 95% or 99% would say, yes, I believe in God and God is my first love. He's my number one. I mean, you wouldn't, there's so many other options that you can do, especially in our society where people don't go to church. You have every excuse in the world not to, but you made a decision today. So I know the, the 
the audience I'm speaking to is a good audience who I believe overall, I mean, you want to, to learn and grow. You wouldn't be here. Now, there may be some people here who say, I'm still seeking, I've got questions. Well, we all do, and I might get it. But overall, you would say, this is an easy one. Check one, we've got this down. Let's go on to, to number two. Not so quick. Let's just, let's just put a point in the meter, as Bishop Palmer would say, right here, and spend a little time. What does it mean to let God be God? for God to be number one, because all of us would say that we have no other gods before God. Let me explain this way through an illustration. Well, you've heard already, and probably tired of it, that I was away last week, but I was in Wyoming, and I love the American West. In fact, over the last several years, I've tried once a year to escape out there. I wouldn't want to live here because this is home, but I love going out and being part of the American West. And Wyoming is, how many have been to Wyoming? It is an absolute beautiful state in, in, in all the regions. And it just so happened last week, I was driving over US 14 over the Bighorn Mountains and I came upon a cattle drive. And I had only had this experience one other time in my life. I mean, it is so fascinating to me. And of course, the cattle are scattered all over the sides of the roads and in the road. And there are maybe 100, 150 head of cattle. And of course, no fences. So you just have to wait and you have to watch. What was so fascinating to me was watching the cowboys and the cowgirls. Especially the cowgirls, just because I'm not used to those images. But 15-year-old uh, girls with, of course, cowboy hats, and they had they were on cowgirl hats, and they were on horseback, and they were rounding up these cattle. And it was so fun watching these teenagers, nearly 20-year-olds, just moving these cattle along. And when I think about letting God be God, there was a movie about 30 years ago, maybe some of you heard of it before, about a cattle drive. It just came to mind. It's the old movie City Slingers. <laughs> And it was in 1991, you may not remember that, but uh, Billy Crystal was in it, he was a younger guy then, and it was about these four middle-aged guys who were going through a midlife crisis, they were from a city like Chicago or some place, and they decided to take a week and go out west and go participate in a cattle drive just to experience something new and get some perspective in life and clear their mind. And there's this classic scene that's come to mind this week in the movie of this tough weathered cowboy named Curly, and he's riding on a horse in the cattle drive, and Billy Crystal, he is one of the guys in the midlife crisis, around 39, 40 years old, who comes up alongside of Curly, and Curly says, you guys just don't get it. You come out here, you get your rope all tied up in knots throughout the year from the big city. Then you come out here and you think that you can unwind this rope in two weeks and make everything right. And, and Crystal says, what do you mean? And Curly points out this bony finger, this cowboy, and he said, one thing, one thing. And Crystal says, what are you talking about? Your finger is the one thing? He says, no, the secret of life, the purpose of life is one thing. Billy Crystal says, what is that one thing? And Curly says, that's what you've got to figure out. Let me ask you a question, Brooke Sadie and I met this church. Have you figured out the one thing? There are a lot of different things clamoring for our attention. And if we settle for those cheap imitations, they'll get our rope all tied up in knots. We discover what that one thing, that big thing, that main thing is. All the other things will fall into place. Let me tell you what the one thing is. It's loving the God who loves you. If you get that right and put that first, all other things will come about in due time, in God's way and will. Jesus said in Matthew that the lady sang about, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Are you 
putting God as your one thing? Really? What does it mean to worship God as God? Well, Martin Luther, the great Christian reformer, not Martin Luther King Jr., although he was a great Christian leader, but the older one, the one of the Middle Ages, Martin Luther, in referring to this, said this quote that I've never forgotten after I read it. Now listen to him, he says, whatever your heart clings to, whatever your heart relies on, whatever your main focus is of life, then that is your God. That is your one thing. If you take a compass and you can go in many different directions, but if you rest, it'll come back to true north. When your mind is empty, what does it focus on? What is that one thing that shapes your life? Or Luther says, that actually is in the first chair. That is your God. So if we're not careful, and here's the rub, okay? I'm a preacher, so I'm preaching myself into you. It can be all love and comfort every week, amen? I gotta be true to the word. God has some things for us to say. Uh, if we're not careful here, we can give lip service that God is our God, but we can focus, we can love in the priority seat many other things before God. It could be a person. Now, these are good things where God has given us. It could be our children. It could be a sport. It could be a hobby. It could be boating or fishing. What is it that consumes the way that we spend money, the way that we spend our time, our energy? It could be motorcycling. That's me. I always, it's a constant battle that I have to say. Am I focusing more on that? There's nothing wrong with all these good loves that God has given us in life, but what consumes us? It could be a relationship. It could be a boyfriend or girlfriend that's supposed to be a blessing to us, but it has become what we worship what we adore beyond anything else. You know what a number one thing in Central Ohio is? Now, I'm gonna get in trouble for this, but I feel like I wouldn't be faithful if I didn't say it. If John Wesley came to Central Ohio, well, here's a guy from a different age, a different culture, and he would come to Central Ohio, what would he say is worshiped by the masses? The Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> Ohio State football. Now, I'm a Buckeye fan, so don't get me wrong, go rotten. Uh, tomatoes at me, okay? <laughs> oh, H. I oh, okay. I watched the game yesterday. I was not happy with the results, okay? I'm a fan. But I want to put it in a proper perspective, like you, right? But where do we spend? You know, we sang, Come Christians, join the sing. Some of you were thinking Carmen Ohio. <laughs> now, listen, Come Christians, join the sing. The lyrics of that tune was written way before the boys in the dorm or in the football team put those words to a Christian hymn for common life. But where do we spend our schedule? And so many of us, how we raise, we spend all of our focus. And again, I'm a fan. We spend all of our focus and our money. We would never, never miss a game, at least on TV. But when the stadiums throughout America are packed, the churches are empty. Whatever you're, listen to Luther, classic Luther, Whatever your heart clings to, your first love. Oh God, forgive us. Thank you for the blessings you've given of joy and sports and enjoyment. And I enjoy all those things. But help us to never lose our focus. And I think we know deep down in our hearts, don't we? I think we know, right? So how do we, we wrap things up before it gets even worse for me up here in the middle of uh, uh, in the middle of Columbus, Ohio. Listen, gang. So how do we keep God as God? That, that's the key. Now I'm a Methodist, and I'm proud of that. I'm a Wesleyan, and so I'm more than just a name Methodist. Um, I agree with John Charles Wesley how they approach the spiritual life, and. They knew that to have spiritual disciplines helped them to be faithful. 
And so I need, if I just leave it to myself, I'll wander. But if I have spiritual disciplines like the Wesleyans, it helps me then to keep my focus, not to lose my first love. So let me give you a four, and these will be quick. Four things that you can do, that we can do, to help us to always keep God in the first chair, okay? Now, if you're taking notes, number one, give God the first minutes of every day. Give God the first minutes. This week, uh, when you wake up, before maybe you go to the Twitter feed or the Facebook uh, feed or the newspaper for those who read it or turn on the weather, just take a moment to acknowledge that God is the source of your life. Spend a little time in meditation. Before my feet hit the floor out of the bed, I usually whisper a prayer. Thank you, Lord, for giving me another day to live, giving me food I'll have today. Just to acknowledge his presence. Not that that's just his time, the whole week is, but at the first of the day, I want to acknowledge to him that he's the Lord of the whole day. So that's a good principle you can do, even if you're off to a Buckeye game or a motorcycling event or whatever, but you're still at the beginning of the day acknowledging of this day, Lord, you're still number one in my life. Give God the first minutes of the day. Secondly, give God the first day of the week. Give God the first day of the week in worship. Now, I'm not talking about some legalistic approach that says that every single Sunday morning you have to be in a certain seat to get your Sunday school pens, or that God is making a list and checking it twice and going to find out if you've been naughty or nice. No, <laughs> we live in the grace of God. But we need worship corporately and also individually. And if we acknowledge God the first of the week, as the disciples did, and they broke bread on the first day of the week, it's saying not just that day, but the whole week. I'm starting out in first fruits, it's called. I'm starting out acknowledging that God is the source. Now, if you're away or traveling, it's understandable. So you, there's still places you can find for worship. If you're at a campground, perhaps you just circle the wagons with your family or others who are with you and you read a scripture or sing a, a hymn, or, or maybe they may have even uh, a service on the campground. I, some of the greatest services and experiences my wife and I have experienced have been on vacation, we've been away, and it's given us a new perspective. Or maybe it's that you, you work and you can't possibly uh, worship in the morning, but you can get online and watch this video, or you can worship at home with family, but in some way through worship. The Bible directly says, do not forsake the assembling together, Hebrews chapter 10, as some are in the habit of doing. So give God the first day of the week in some way. And I'm going to talk more about Sabbath on the fourth commandment. Number three, give God the first part of your income. When you sit down and pay your bills, do you first pay all of your uh, bills of your needs and wants, and then whatever is left over, you give to God? Or do you acknowledge up front, Lord, you're the source not of this giving amount, but the source of everything I have, my whole life, what I'll eat today, the daily bread, my house, it's all yours. And I acknowledge that by saying that you're the Lord of my finances, not me, and I trust you. Uh, give God the first part of your income. Deuteronomy chapter 14, 23 says, the purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your life. And I just want to encourage you here that things will fall into place. Um, it's amazing how God meets our needs. When I was 22 years old, I didn't grow up giving like that. In fact, I didn't give at, at all. My parents gave a little bit, but I didn't give. But when I became a pastor, I said to the Lord in prayer, God, I either believe your word or I don't. It would be so hypocritical of me not to give of my first fruits to you. And I'm going to trust you. And God continues to take care. He opens up doors and closes doors. And I just want to encourage you there. It's not a have to, it's a get to. Encouragement there in that area. Number four, give God the first voice of your decisions. Before you um, go to all other places, if you want to make him the God of your life, before going for counsel or advice to friends or secular counselors, which they can be good, or certainly before going to public opinion polls, <laughs> or hopefully you're not going to the horoscopes, go to the Lord and ask God's direction. 
for your life. Um, remember about 25 years ago, it was very popular in our society to say, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And I know it got a little crazy there and a little extreme, but that's still a good question to ask. Before you fire off some angry email, ask the question, oh, would Jesus do this? Before you respond to a person in need, ask the question, what would Jesus do? I got to the place where I learned I'm not going to respond, hopefully I'll live this out here in this church, to an angry email. Some conversations are better face to face, but you, those things just escalate. There's no way you quote win in those situations. And Bitter, hurting people hurt people, amen? So we don't know what's brought about some of the junk that we get. I was talking to someone this morning in their service where they say they, the hate mail they get is just tremendous from their work because they're a public person. And what they've learned to get balance is to realize that who they are beyond what other people say. They're a child of God. And sometimes it's best not to respond in a way that's going to escalate the situation. So give God the first um, part of making decisions of how you react to a different situation or a decision you have to make. Let me wrap things up by saying, again, what is your one thing? And are you spending your life on the right thing? When I was in junior high, I played basketball, and I played basketball in high school. But in junior high, in seventh grade, at Duncan Falls Junior High School, along the Skinham River, our basketball practice was not right after school. Other people were using our small gym. And so we had to wait. We had about an hour and a half before we get into the gym. Now, I don't know what my parents thought we were doing an hour and a half, but we weren't staying in school. <laughs> I remember now looking back that this was in the mid 80s and what was popular for teenage boys in the mid 80s was a place called the arcade you might remember how popular the arcade was now some of you uh on the balcony are maybe a little too young to to know this but uh but you have games at home but that was the place you would go i mean they had the latest and the greatest games i mean pac-man uh, centipede asteroid and they were all a quarter. And I never had any money. Even when I had jobs, I seemed like I never had any money to spend. And so I was always one of those watchers where I had my head around the box watching people, other people play the games. But once in a great while, and it was a glorious moment when it happened, I would borrow a quarter. I was always asking, but never getting. But once in a while, I'd have a quarter or I'd have a little extra from my lawn mowing job. And I'd usually only have one. And so I wouldn't just go and spend it real quick. See, I'd savor it for a moment. I would watch others. And then I wanted to make sure, if I only had a one quarter, that I would spend it on the right one. And when I did, at least for a moment, boy, it was something else. Let me ask you a question as we close. Are you spending your one and only life on the right one? Have you figured it out what that one thing is that Curly would say? It's loving the God who loves and created you. And friends, when you figure that out, all these other blessings that we have, and these gifts and these hobbies in God's way, and well, be added unto you in God's time. Would you pray with me? Oh Lord, I thank you for these Ten Commandments. Our society needs them more than ever. But more importantly, our church needs them more than ever. And we as individuals need to hear them again. And so badly, Lord, I want for you, and I know I pray and speak for the others in this room, for you to be our one and only thing. And God, I just personally ask for forgiveness for the times that I've let other gods clamor for my attention. And sometimes, God, I let them pull right up next beside you and sometimes ahead of you in my focus. 
but you never give up on me and each of us. You gently remind us how jealous you are because you love us so much. And God, in those times, I love you even more. That you never give up on me and that you would always come alongside through Jesus Christ. So Lord, I pray that we will take what we've heard today from these ancient commandments and start working on them this week. Thank you, Lord, that you've shown us the way to life, and it's good. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand, and now we're going to sing from Matthew chapter 6, the song that Janet and Marla sang in the solo, Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. Let's stand. It's on hymn number 405. And we'll sing it from the hymnal or from the screen. Seek ye first. <laughs> close to our hearts, and that is to allow God to be God of our lives. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. Bless you this week until we meet again. Amen.